Let's now go to the fourth of the four immeasurables. <clears throat> Is equanimity in Sanskrit upeksha, in Pali upekka. <clears throat> And equanimity is uh, a mind of impartiality. It's a, a mind, an unbiased mind. Now our mind tends to be very partial or biased. And we tend to categorise people into three groups simply from the perspective of how they seem to affect us. So those people around us who seem to support me and my happiness, we tend to label as friend. Those people around us who don't seem to affect me and my happiness in any way, stranger. Those people around us who seem to interfere with me and my happiness and maybe even seem to cause me suffering, the so-called enemy. And then, of course... We end up with attachment to friends because they seem to be the source of our happiness. We end up with apathy to strangers because they're not affecting us in any way, so I couldn't care less what happens to them. And then we end up with hostility, anger and hatred to difficult people because they seem to be interfering with my happiness and even seem to be the source of my suffering. So we have attachment to friends, apathy to stranger. Hostility, anger, hatred to the enemy, the difficult people. Equanimity is about overcoming this biased attitude. And the way we can begin to do that is to reflect on the fact that we all want to be happy, we all want to be free of suffering. We're all equal in this regard. We're all stuck in the same situation, trying to be happy, trying to be free of suffering. And through that reflection, developing a sense of closeness to everyone, that we're all in the same situation, we're all striving for the same goal. And it's this mind of equanimity which allows us to cultivate the other three qualities towards all living beings. Because without equanimity, we tend to be, in our loving kindness, compassion, empathy, joy, quite biased in who we do those practices for. So that's equanimity. Um, any questions about any of the four measurables? Okay, one more topic I'd like to go through. And that is, and we can see this actually in one of your charts here in your booklet. There's a, on page four, the four immeasurables chart. We can see for each of the four immeasurables there we have a definition, we have what's called approximate cause, then we have what's called near enemy, and distant or far enemy, sign of success and remedy or bodyguard. So what I'd like to focus on now is this what's called near enemy. Because the far enemy is something that's completely opposite to the quality. So that's very clear. <coughs> but what's called the near enemy is something that we really need to... So it's easy to see the far enemy because it's something that's completely opposite. But the near enemy is often the thing that interferes in this practice. And the reason it interferes is we don't identify it. It's a little bit like, you know... If, if we have some enemies and one of the enemies infiltrates into our camp and pretends to be one of us, but all the while they're, they're sort of uh, undermining our side. So it's a little bit like that, is that each of these four immeasurables has what's called a near enemy, which sort of infiltrates 
and pretends to be this quality, but actually is corrupting and causing problems for the quality. And so we are to identify what this near enemy is and when it starts to arise, to deal with it. So let's have a look at, and each one of these four measurables has a near enemy, something that seems to be that quality, but actually is uh, polluting, corrupting it, is causing problems. One of them we've already seen, and that's here we see is that the near enemy for loving kindness is attachment. So we saw that already. So we saw there that, particularly in terms of relationship, if we allow attachment to come into the relationship, it really creates problems in terms of a healthy relationship, in terms of loving kindness. So therefore, they're usually mixed together where to distinguish them and really then reduce the attachment and increase loving kindness. So fortunately, one of the other immeasurables can act as an antidote to the near enemy. So if we find that our loving kindness is simply degenerating into attachment, then it's very good to reflect on equanimity. Because remember, equanimity is about not only overcoming attachment to friends, but it's apathy to strangers, aversion to difficult people. So equanimity can help us to then reduce that attachment. So it acts as an antidote to attachment. Equanimity has its own near enemy. So remember, equanimity is an equal attitude to everyone. But of course, we can be equally indifferent to everyone. And we may feel like we're being, we have equanimity, because actually, I couldn't care less equally about anybody. Oh yes, I'm very, I have a lot of equanimity. I'm not being biased or partial, because I couldn't care less about anyone, <laughs> equally. But of course, this is not equanimity. Um, so if we find that our equanimity is degenerating into simply being equally indifferent to everyone, then it's good to cultivate compassion. Because it's difficult to, to maintain this apathy or indifference to everyone when we see people suffering. But compassion also has its own near enemy. And in fact, I think here there are sort of two near enemies for compassion. And one is that is pity. Because pity can seem like compassion because we are focusing on others' suffering. But compassion, of course, is focusing on their suffering and wishing to help and seeing them as on our level. Whereas pity is really like putting ourselves above others and going, poor you, I'm okay, but poor you. So that seems like it could be compassion, but it's not. So for pity, again, equanimity is going to be very helpful. But there's another near enemy... And that is despair, that we're focusing on others' suffering and we're really getting overwhelmed by it. So it could seem like this is like compassion. You know, this is a little bit what we're talking about, sort of compassion burnout. So one thing that's going to be very helpful here is to focus on the positives of ourselves and others, to have a balanced view. And so therefore, it's 
good to focus on equini on uh, empathetic joy. But empathetic joy also has its own near enemy because remember empathetic joy is a rejoicing in our own and others' virtue and good fortune. But this rejoicing could degenerate into simply rejoicing about meaningless things and even to the point of rejoicing when we see others suffer. So if we see that our empathetic joy is degenerating into sort of meaningless or frivolous rejoicing... So frivolous just means meaningless rejoicing or even harmful rejoicing. Then it's good to reflect on loving kindness because loving kindness is aspiration, a wish for ourselves and others to have happiness in its causes. And so that can help to overcome that uh, meaningless rejoicing. So we can see here that each of the four immeasurables has a near enemy and how we can really help to overcome that. Um, any questions on that? Yeah. So for, for the near enemy of compassion, despair, can you clarify that why empathetic joy can help cut through that? Yeah. Um, because often it's because that we're having too much focus on the negative. We see, like, no hope. It's all doom and gloom. And so we're not focusing on the positives. We don't see that there are actually good things happening and good possibilities. So if we focus on that, that can help to have a balanced view of that situation. But also, of course, as part of that as well, we can focus on the fact that what is, and this comes back to what we looked at earlier, the, the understanding of what is suffering and what are the causes of suffering as well. But I think here one thing that really, and we see this a lot in our modern society, we've got too much focus on the negative and we really need to have a balanced view. So that can help give that little bit of balance to that. I don't understand how you work with the, all this. You, you have a lot of how you work with this. How it's uh, practical? How it's become practical? This. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you find that you're getting a lot of attachment to people. So all the time you think about the, the antidote. So. Or you do it in with meditation or, or. Yeah. So of course, if these. All this is just intellectual ideas. It's going to be very difficult. Very difficult. Like we saw the last two days, when we apply antidotes, and if those antidotes are just some intellectual process, it'll be hard work. I mean, it'll work a little bit maybe, but it's going to be hard work. But if we've done these practices, meditation practices, and we've brought them into daily life, and we're familiar with them, then when we find that our loving kindness is becoming attachment, all we have to really do is bring to mind this, which we've already cultivated and familiar with. And just bringing it to mind will dispel it. But if we haven't meditated on this and we haven't cultivated it, and it's just an intellectual idea, it's going to be hard. It's the same with all antidotes. We need the antidote is only effective if we've cultivated the antidote, if we've made it experiential. Then it can really be very effective. So if we've really meditated and reflected and internalized equanimity, and then when we see attachment arising, all we really have to do is just very briefly bring it to mind and then tch, gone. That's all I wanted to cover today. So um, tomorrow's session in this in the compassion wing, we've now covered the four immeasurables, which is the foundation for the compassion wing. And so tomorrow we're going to start to look at the level of Mahayana, this idea of bodhicitta, 
what it is and how we go about cultivating that. So that's going to be the topic for tomorrow and at least the following day as well. Okay, so on that note, let's take a tea break and uh, 3.45 of course the yoga session and then come back here at 5 o'clock and we'll continue this practice of observing the mind, the shamatha practice of observing the mind. Thank you.